Thank you for coming. Uh, this performance this evening is dedicated to Sam Isidore and Gabe Valdez, my partners in crime. It's called Whistleblower. We tried walking into the water, but brought our fears with us instead. From the start of the last century, thousands of women were drowned each year, their swimsuits covering them head to toe, high cinched collars, long flowing sleeves tightly buttoned at wrists, giant flounced wool flannel, ankle length skirts and shoes pulling them under made certain that when their corpses were fetched from the water, their modesty was still intact. The swimsuits did their jobs. Our ancestors would rather drown themselves and the people they loved instead of chancing the seeing of a woman's naked calf. We believed that the sight of their wet legs glistening on the beach, walking from the surf, would have been more harmful to us than their corpses. Wait for a large storm, preferably a hurricane or typhoon. Find a major city. Find a tall building. Find the 100th floor. Strip naked. Press yourself hard against the floor to ceiling window. The sharp cool of the glass presses back against you. You are floating now. You can't see the ground, only the roiling clouds and rain tumbling beneath you. The sharp cool of the glass presses back against you. You press harder, trying to will yourself through the glass, and you will feel the floor move and shift, and you will hear the tower howl as it sways in the storm, and you will know that if the wind blew just a little bit harder, and the earth turned just a little bit faster, and gravity lost its focus for just a moment, you would be flung up off this wet rock rise up and spin and slip your way into the heavens. But right now, gravity, rain, and wind lick and paw at you through a thin sheet of glass, and you, not knowing or caring who is watching you, and you, not knowing or caring who is recording you. Because one day soon, each of us will have to find the way to the 100th floor in all of our storms. And as we stand there, pressed against the window, begging for release, there will be a moment of clarity. We are those drowned women. They have never left us. We are the Victorian bathing machines, responsible for all this murder. We will leverage our dead. We will push and pull ourselves through the transparency of culture and multiplexers, haul the corn, pour buckets of Vermont maple on top of our servers, and wait for ourselves to respond from the other side with familiar language. Will ourselves into pulses of light with the same reckless abandon that we use to will those ridiculous bathing suits through the crowning windows of our skyscrapers. Either find new math or suspend the physics. When a small child in Tibet thinks of those drowned women, closes her eyes, drops her head and prays for those corpses on our old beaches, the minute prayer and body touch in her mind, Penthouse windows are blown out across the world. 
she prays harder. harder. Death trap bathing suits fly from those windows and float to earth, twisting and turning the same way they did, descending in the water, holding on to their victims for dear life. She, she prays harder. harder. The top floor of every tower disappears. We are no longer safely tucked inside the engineer's envelope, but how safe is a broken heart? How safe is it? How can you read its wake, looking for faint digital traces of what used to be here? This broken thing, this organic encryption defies rune stones and the bond markets. What is this worth if not my life? What is this worth if not my life, right? The divide growing, filled with suede assumptions, pressed between my crisis and broken mirrors, and I know what I'm going to do. And I, and know, I know what, what I'm, I'm going, going to, to do. do. And I know, I know what I'm going to do. And I know that I will miss you. I'm caught between my shadows and the sun of you. This here document contains neither recommendations or conclusions of the FBI. This document is a property of the FBI and is loaned to your agency. The purpose of this document is to help concentrate and focus our efforts at locating Special Agent Jackson, who went missing on or about July 11, 1968, while conducting surveillance on one Allen Ginsberg, mostly in and around Manhattan. I don't know why I've been asked to do this. A sign to shadow a hippie, a poet. Why does the agency give a shit? I hate the Lower East Side. I hate these fucking rat holes they live in. Why does anyone read their crap. So now, this poet, this Ginsburg, he's going to Cuba. Now, SAC and SSA field office want everything. Who cares? Dumb fuck shit goes to Cuba, really. Who cares? September 21, 1967, surveillance subject Ginsburg leaves Mexico City for Havana, Cuba via Cuba Aviation Airlines flight number 465. He's listed on the manifest as pastor number eight. He has been contracted by the Evergreen Review to do a survey of the Cuban literary scene. Subject expected back in Manhattan Ten days. When Ginsburg gets back, he pretends that he doesn't see me standing there on the fire escape across the street 
from 745 East 5th Street, apartment 504. He's got a tan. He's actually starting to look like a lion. First panic attack hits. When I finally catch my breath, I pick myself up off the ground, I run across the street, I barge into his building, I run up five flights, and I kick on his door with my knuckles. Ginsburg opens the door, puts up his hand. I'm going to tell you what Moondog told me. You need to listen to more Bach and Mozart right before slamming his door in my face, leaving me standing there outside. I stood there for almost 30 minutes, breathing on his apartment doorbell. What is going on in there? Who is he to lecture me on Bach? What did any of this bullshit mean? I can feel people moving around in there, but I don't hear anything. Why is this warlock's apartment so quiet? Why does the government care? Bizarre, but not dangerous. I wrote that in one of my first reports. Things settled for a while that summer. I'd stand by the phone booth across the street and I'd watch his shades, always drawn, but always lit at night. And there was a, a lot of movement, people coming and going, freaks, acolytes, humans. And I began to wonder about what kind of unhinged machine he had running up in that cage of his. What kind of unhinged, what? That was the very first time I ever violated an explicit order from the Bureau. I bought one of Ginsburg's books. <laughs> Bureau file number 105-17345-J. The reason for adding Allen Ginsberg to special security lists following below, because he met all of the listed criteria, evidence of emotional instability, constantly changing of jobs, unstable employment or residence records, expressions of strong or violent anti-U.S. sediment, prior acts, including but not limited to arrests, convictions, or thoughts, or whispers indicating a propensity for antipathy towards good order in government. I've been instructed to re-interview his friends. I must also report that I felt bad because of something that Ginsburg wrote. He somehow made me see my brother standing there, the way the sunlight hit his face as he boarded that troop ship never to be seen again. I don't know how this hippie has forced me to see my brother standing there, filled with all his promise. I must also report that I felt bad for him, for Ginsburg. I told him the names of 28 of our informants, including his three friends. He just stood there in that apartment doorway combing that unruly mane of his, looking like a goddamn lion. I told him 
that we had everything he needed to take us down. He said nothing to me. He just smiled and said nothing like he knew it all, like he knew all the secrets, even the ones that I didn't know. It's maddening, really, okay? Because I'm trying to help him. I must admit that on several occasions, I offered Allen Ginsberg Super 8 footage and photographs of agency personnel doing things that are natural, including Director Hoover, all these pictures in the box, everything he needed to fry us, to bring us down, to take us out. I must report that in the future, all future reports, Erwin Allen Ginsberg will be referred to by his rightful name, The Lion. I must report that I did feel bad for him. I must report that I did offer him those photographs and that Super 8 footage with Director Hoover. All he did was smile at me and ask how long I was going to remain with the Bureau. It's maddening. What's wrong with you, hippie? This has got a bow on it. And that was the first time I ever heard his voice in my head, only in my head, in my teeny little head. He said, you're too late. The revolution has already started. I rushed to the terminal bar. I rushed through five Jamesons. I couldn't figure out how this hippie got his voice in my head. And I said, no, no, that wasn't his voice in my head. Second panic attack hit, worse than the first. I thought this hippie must have somehow slipped LSD into my food or my drink. But we didn't eat together and we didn't drink together. What's wrong with me? Why am I unraveling that fucking book? Special Agent Jackson must report the following. Kansas, Jews, Cots, impellers, Negro streets, microwaves, and there's no more heroin around the edges. S.A. Jackson must report the following. Kerouac, Ferlinghetti, Indian Head Legions, Marmalade Cobblers, Loisida, a closed finger bitten in the back of a horse's mouth. The 13th missing chord change, the church, the fucking church, his fucking church in the streets where every mineral that was once lost in the asphalt pushes itself into the air, cascades of black sands swirling down Avenue C into a halo over the Empire State Building. This is the church, this is the church, this is the fucking church. His bells are ringing across the globe. It's not his fault. It's like blaming a wave for breaking your back. The prayers have worked. I've been rendered and splayed by the lion. None of you fuckers can possibly understand. I understand the lion now. I am the towering clouds above us with the rain. I am these tenements. I am these redwoods. I am this dovan. I am this prayer. I am sinking into this grass. Don't you get it yet? I've joined the lion's circus and I'm never coming back. This is Special Agent Jackson. And this is my final surveillance report. Moving forward, leaving tracks in invisible digital snow. Our footprints filled with our hopes and desires, laying there, pointing back at us like accusations. We are parsed and monetized. No more veering, parsed and fractal, Boolean. A forest of souls, dead still, petrified through inhibition. When I was 12 years old, I was detained for spitting on a long retired Nixon's limo. Fuck it, fuck him. 
I explained that I was half Maasai and that we always greet each other and seal deals this way. I was given a ticket for disturbing the peace that I promptly mailed to myself at my old address in Mombasa. Taken in by a beautiful lesbian, she clothed us and fed us. We took the Serengeti back to the village. Everyone was crying. Everyone was doomed. A hyena had crossed the headman's path that morning. Now the village was doomed. What if no one had seen it? I shouted. What if all the pythons had been ignored and the Cape Buffalo and every blade of grass hadn't been plowed through and wrenched from inside our head like pocket lint by Edward Snowden? What if no one had seen it? Would the village still be doomed? I am clothed in millions of my accumulated choices, shining like dragon scales. As I move, each thought, each movement, generating more armor and scales, each weighed and measured until all the machines stop, all the schools close, all the buses empty into depots. We grind to a halt from the commitment and dedication of counting our own scales. This is work that should have been farmed out. Bluffdale, Utah is just a village, a hive, filled up and humming with tech workers, constantly humming, recalibrating, ownership of my memories and deep moments of trust. Moscow is not oblivion. It's not even a launch pad. Quite the opposite. Moscow is sticky fly trap. And I am assured of just one thing going forward, that who I love will kill me or love me forever. Years before, right next to the bodega, there was a botanica. I still remember the beautiful smell of peppermint and rotting wood and the morning barrio sun spilling in through their open windows. Now there are eight cameras in the sandwich shop that replaced it. I still prefer the 80s memory loops in my head and their exactness. It's a feeling. Like dementia, it's hard to put it back on the shelf. There's a certain freedom attached to it. All the barriers can come down. All the things that kept us from ourselves, bargains and half-truths, running pirate errands down passageways that used to be filled with hoarding until it didn't matter anymore. Until the walls that we worked so hard to build began to fall away and drift into orbit with the vibrating atoms that used to be beneath our feet. These are the micro anime loops playing in our heads as mushroom deer clouds wait for us on the very edges of our rain systems and how we long for the storms that used to hold us. We evaporate with joy before we fall back with the rain into the churning sea. The problem is, all I have are feelings, and everything else is wrong. I remember the very first time that I kissed her. Time turned in on itself to suspend us together. But if I let you watch that kiss, the hour just before up to and including 
the hour after if it was your job to ponder that kiss and study it and polish it like a grain of sand and there was a team of analysts so for every second of our kiss they spend 24 hours a day studying us in shifts I can only tell them about how I felt, how you made me feel. Everything else I tell them about the kiss will be wrong. kept stretching across the fields, rivers, and bays. We buttoned a landscape to the collar of a telegraph wire, forcing it all through, hoping the colonies returned to us, shorn of pesky Indians and their quicksand eyes that make you wonder which of you is trapped and drowning. I wake from this fever, riding a bullet train, powered by refrigerator magnets, the mania of empire, and loopholes. I stare blankly at the blur of dancing poles and wires flashing by overhead until it becomes clear to me that we must bring back the stagecoaches, let them run around scurrying back and forth, carrying all the messages between head and heart, and once we're all finally completely out of sync from all the delays. We collapse with pride, a job well done. A drunken Taurus passed out in the sand. A beautiful hillock covered in clover and sun. And one day it appeared, not a grim army of horsemen and siege weapons appearing on the crest. No, one day it appeared a single telegraph pole, a single wire appearing on the grid like it had grown there. Somewhere, a glass bell rang gently. Just a telephone pole, just a little bit of wire, just a little bit of copper, just the smallest amount of current. Samuel Morse sent the first message down the wires. Witnesses claim that his prophetic coding, tapping, and scratching encrypted cuneiform detail. They said that his body seized, racked and raked by hidden and unseen forces. He sat at the telegraph station, eyes closed, sweaty, fingers hovering, not in control of his own substations. His fingers suddenly thundered down on the transmit key. The first message sent down the wire. What hath God wrought? And the wires kept stretching across the fields, rivers, and bays. Creeper vines that atomize and bathe their way through us. We are awash in our own radiation. The prophet Samuel Morse was possessed and correct. What hath God wrought?
You very nearly killed me. I was in a cafe in Leonisovsky. And there you were, your face swimming in my teacup. And suddenly, I, like a warning, you, you hit me with such a wallop that I, I couldn't blink you away. It took my legs from underneath me. Everything was so clear. Everything was so clear. We were swimming in that fresh, sweet water, creating our own secret language. We, we hauled ourselves onto that dock. I was on my back, and, and you hovered over me, your wet hair swaying, making the sun blink. <laughs> you drank the water from the shallow gullies between my ribs, raised your eyes to meet mine. And I knew two things. You were the only heir I ever wanted to breathe, and we were doomed. Yeah. Well, this all flashed through me in an instant. I, I came round again as two men were helping to pick me up off the floor of the cafe. I didn't know I had been tasered until I was already in the van. No one had guessed where this was all going. At first, there were moments, then agile streams, then rivers, then oceans of cosplay, morphing at alarming rates. It sounds funny now, years later, that the banks didn't all freak out and lose it when all their janitors and engineers stopped showing up for work. They were out grilling kebabs inside of their favorite video games and they weren't coming back. 
The next week, half of the rest showed up in costume. There weren't enough to fill the jobs already, so they let it stand. Soon, only the very elderly and the littlest babies didn't wear costumes and masks obscuring their faces. Still, they were being tracked. So, everyone started meeting in the streets and exchanging their wireless devices, a single device changing hands hundreds of times, thousands of times per day. And the masses all started posting porn loop selfies online and that ended slut shaming for good, kind of. They were still being tracked. So we walked out of the offices, we burned the landlines, and we tried to make our own paper because we were still being tracked. And after we burned through the last tree and the only electrical signals that we had left came from inside of our hearts and our word clouds stumbled and collapsed through the Kirby dot substrata and the miracle of green lawns, it was still enough. It was all I ever needed. It was still enough. The sound, that crackle of static it, that was coming all from I inside that, that, this uh, chest. Uh, that's, I hear that sound, that crackle of static coming from inside this chest and and I, I think of things like thrush um, I like the word thrush he feels so gentle uh, and forgiving even in the dark oh, I, I, I feel very close to you now and the closer I get to the end, the more you matter, the more the time we spent together matters. I was on that boat for a long time, months or years. I, mean, I can't say, I don't even know if they admit they have me. I only do one thing here. I tell them about you. Yeah, and I tell them about you and the beach and your skin and all your smiles. And I I tell them all. I tell anyone who will listen about about how you made me feel. It was it was still, still enough. enough. It was all I that was all that was needed. That sound. I hear that sound. That crackle of static. That coming crackle from inside of static this chest. Coming from this chest. It was still enough. It was still enough. It was all I ever needed. It was all I needed. That I, sound. I, I hear that, that sound. Crackle that, that, that crackle of static. Coming from coming inside from this, this chest. Coming from this chest. It was chest. still enough. It, it was, was still all enough. I ever needed. That, that was sound. all I needed. That crackle of static. That crackle coming of static. Coming from inside this coming. chest. It was still enough. It was all I ever needed to hear that sound, that crackle of static coming from inside this chest. It was still enough. It was all I ever needed to hear that sound, that crackle of static coming from inside this chest. It was still enough. It was all I ever needed to hear that sound, that crackle of static coming from inside this chest. It was still enough. That crackle of static coming from inside this chest. I was still alive. It was all that was needed. I hear that sound. That crackle of static coming from inside this chest. It was still enough. That was all that was needed. I hear that sound, that crackle of static coming from inside this chest. It's still enough. That was all that was needed. I hear that sound.